Some Muslim women and girls choose to cover their hair with a hijab or veil, honoring traditional views of modesty and asserting their own very modern Muslim identities. Hijab should ideally be a personal choice, but in recent years it has become a political debate. At the Religious Worlds of New York Summer Institute for Teachers, Muslim community leaders reflected on their own choices to wear or not wear hijab. I wonder if you could think back and, and um, talk a little bit about your decision when you started to veil. Yeah. Um, what was that for you personally as a choice and what were the factors that you had on your mind? Yeah, um, so it, it was definitely a choice. Um, at that time, my, my mother, my aunt, did not wear hijab. Um, they wore, you know, a shawl like this from Pakistan. Um, for me, it, it started off as as like something that I thought I couldn't do, and I couldn't give myself a, like a not like a non shallow reason why. And it became like a challenge. Um, I was like, can I do this? You know, can I have people sort of like look at me and accept me? Um, if I cover my hair. And so it started off that way and then it very quickly like became something else. You know, I, I did notice people treated me differently. All of a sudden I became like a foreigner and I was like, oh my God, that's so weird. I didn't know what that was like. Um, you know, I think to your question, like how do you have the conversation with, with young people who may see it as like a sign of oppression? It, it kind of goes back to what I mentioned earlier of like uplifting people and their stories, other women. You know, Seventeen Magazine, um, I was looking to in the Seventeen Magazine, <laughs> but like just a few months ago, they, they started sort of sharing stories of like young Muslim women in like high schools across the country and like their, um, their reason for wearing a job, but also like how else, in, in what other ways are they like equally amazing? You know, it's like you started to see, you know, flipping through a magazine, like seeing a young girl in a job sitting on, you know, on her bed because she's writing a blog or whatever it was. It, it, I think the opportunity whenever it presents itself to sort of humanize Islam by uplifting stories of other young women. There's so many examples. You know, there's um, a woman who's actually in the Olympics right now, Ibtihaj Muhammad. She's a fencer. She's like representing the U.S in the Summer Olympics. Um, you know, there are stories, and she's from, she's from Jersey, so we'll bring you her. But like, <laughs> 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 you know, and she's in a job doing this. So there are so many like, incredible young women who are out there, so many women out there. You don't see them on television. You don't hear their stories. Actually, Ibtihaj was on Ellen. Uh, and I remember that story sort of kind of going viral. Um, but it's like uplifting, uplifting those moments. You know, I I um I wear the job now. I remember someone in the subway asking me, you know, you know, telling me to go back in one of those rare moments in New York. There aren't that many, at least I haven't experienced too many of them. So I kinda like go back to where you came from, why do you wear that? And and you know, this is American, it's like I feel so American with my hijab, you know, like it's just, and it's something that I can't describe. It's like, I don't know how else to say it. I don't think I would be a feminist or a social activist without my I think that, you know, I think my confidence, I don't have enough swagger to wear the hijab full time, so I'm not even so proud of you. I think you could have to have swagger to wear it every day, you know? Like, no, but I think I would not be a feminist, and I don't think I would be a social activist if I were not, if I were not grounded in myself. Can I pause on that one for a second? Most, I don't have to tell you now, we're back to popular media and public media, but this generally, generally does not represent um, hijabi as requiring swagger. I can't say that. It's too often described as the absolute opposite of swagger. So say a little more yeah. about your choice. I think it takes a lot of guts to conviction, Marshala, to, to cover. You have to do a your bad for. You know, like if you're, you know, like if like the Sikhs have the swagger, the nuns, the Amish, and the Hasidic you both have it. You know, and it's something that comes from within inside you that you do it for a conviction and for a purpose. You know, and uh, I wish I could do it every day. You know, and hopefully one day I, you know, I'll be able to. You know, but I kind of 
you know, like, you know, I've got to rely on them, you know. <laughs> you know, but uh, I think it takes a lot of inspiration. Hopefully I'll get there. Um, but I think uh, Islam really teaches me modesty, teaches me to use my heart and my mind, you know, and uh, it's, it's definitely feminist religion for me. And my family's from Yemen. I came at the age of three. Uh, my father actually, all of his brothers migrated to New York City, opened up their own businesses, restaurants at that time, but now many own bodegas. That's another story. Um, but my dad decided he didn't want to live here and own his own business. So the Ford Motor Company was actually hiring, and he went to Buffalo, New York, got a job, and then sent over for my mother and I. Um, my family was pretty much a part of the assimilation group. You remember those people who came to America and basically told their children, speak English, don't talk about your culture, don't talk about your religion, you're in America now, live the American dream, make the American dream happen. And it was only until I got to middle school where my dad started to talk to me about Islam and because I was asked to advance by a boy, and then that was when the whole introduction of like, well, we're Muslim, we don't do this. <laughs> and that was like my first experience. But I also have to say that um, my experience at school was also very interesting. I always heard negative things about Islam and Muslims. Um, and I remember in middle school one day deciding to wear a hat scarf, not the way that I'm wearing it now, but just like a turban type of thing because I started exploring and reading more. And my social studies teacher told me, why was I wearing this thing on my head? And I just said to her, just fashionably, she said, you know, people from your part of the world, um, when they wear that, they are not free. You know, the women are not free. Um, they are oppressed. And this is a sign of oppression. And I remember I couldn't wait for that period to finish. And I went to the bathroom and ripped it off my head. And I was like, I'm never going to wear this again. Um, so I had a lot of negative um, information based on my, you know, educational upbringing uh, about Islam and Muslims. And it was only till I came to the to New York City, um, where I started actually exploring and trying to figure out my identity, my purpose. We all have those moments, right? Sometime in our life uh, cycle. So um, I was actually going to St. Francis College. I took a lot of, of classes um, in world religion. And I remember one day walking down Atlantic Avenue, for those of you who are New Yorkers, um, and I saw these three African-American Muslim women wearing long robes, their headscarves. They were just so beautiful and talking to each other and laughing. And then I stopped them and I asked them if they were Muslim. Um, so they mentioned to me that they were, and they asked, what was I? I told them that my family was Muslim. I wasn't really practicing. I was in T-shirt and jeans. And, um, and in the conversation, they're like, you know, we're actually going to the local mosque. It's down here on Court Street, the State Street Mosque Dawood, or the Islamic Mission of America. So they're like, we have this class for women from different ethnic and racial groups. You know, if you want to join us. And it's the one time that, you know, you tell your children never talk to strangers or go anywhere with them. <laughs> but something in my heart said, I really need to meet more of these women. So... I asked that the first thing I asked was, I'm not dressed like you guys, and are they gonna let me enter? And they're like, of course, you shouldn't have a problem. So I went, I sat in this group, there were women from different ethnic, racial backgrounds. It was really, really fascinating. And six months into my going to these classes every Saturday, I then finally came home and I told my husband, I think I'm gonna be Muslim. He's like, you are Muslim. We were born Muslim. I was like, no, no, no. I'm going to, you know, start covering my head. Um, you know, I've learned the prayers. I really feel like this is the next phase of my life. Now, mind you, it was not easy to wear a headscarf after so, you know, long of a time not doing so. And it was gradual for me to eventually fully cover all my hair. Um, but it was the most liberating thing because I felt like people were talking to me, not based on everything else, but simply what is coming out of my mouth, what is coming out of my heart, what is coming out of my mind. Um, and I made my peace with hijab being a form of worship, um, not a, you know, a form of, of oppression, as my social studies teacher once told me, but really a form of worship that is extended in my life through everything that I do in the public sphere.